though it has all the markings of a made-for-TV movie with, with larger-than-life characters, with intrigue and suspense, and a plot twist that both leaves you shaking your head and smiling at the same time. Magi from the East following a star to a newborn king. You can't make this stuff up. The current king is enraged by the thought of a rival, even if still in diapers and teething. <laughs> a family in desperate poverty, given the gifts of royalty. And then, in dreams deep, the astrologers are mysteriously told to go home by another way. One of the things that I think makes this story so rich and compelling is that it offers up a classic portrayal of a psychological reality. The attraction-repulsion phenomenon. You've all heard of that? The attraction-repulsion phenomenon. The social psychology of attraction and repulsion is taken from the physical sciences. It's about two magnetic dipoles being attracted and resistant. You know when you would play around with magnets and how one end would repulse from each other and the other end would attract. In common practice, it's exemplified by those moments in our lives when we are both deeply fascinated by something while at the same time being completely disgusted by it. In my personal opinion, I think this is why there is this current phase, this, this, this trend of talking about zombies. <laughs> zombie this and zombie that. Everything's got to be zombie. I saw zombie Christmas ornaments. I think it has at its root this kind of fascination with the attraction and repulsion. I mean, they're dead and they're falling apart and, and it's kind of gross, but they're alive and walking and going to grocery stores and doing everything like you and I do. I also think, on a sadder note, that it's why we are so willing to rubberneck on the highway when we pass an automobile accident. There's the lure of something that's interesting, and yet it's equally horrifying at what may be there. This is not one of our better human characteristics, let's just be honest. And King Herod stands as Exhibit A to prove the point of attraction and repulsion. But I'm going to make the case that the Magi also illustrate attraction and repulsion. In Herod's case, he's strangely attracted to the birth of a new king. He's so attracted to the thought of this king that he actually works hard to find out the details about it. He, he summons these enigmatic travelers from a far off land to, to get off their course to come and tell him all about it. But his attraction is short-lived. He has mostly a repulsion for this infant who posed absolutely no threat to him, we have to say. I mean, number one, the baby was born in a Bethlehem for all the God-forsaken places. It's akin to saying that the next president of the United States would be born in Lindale. That's where you get a ticket. That's not where presidents come from. Bethlehem? Second, the baby was born into poverty, and as much then as is now, it is a steep and rugged climb to travel from poverty to the halls of power. And three, did I mention he was a baby? I'm not sure how old Herod was or how long he would reign, but I rather bet that this babe had just a few years to go before he became anything close to dangerously um, uh, political to Herod. But it, the text makes it quite clear something was going on here because not only was Herod afraid, Herod's fear made all of Jerusalem afraid. Look at the text. 
Sad to say his fears didn't end with this story. We won't read it, but the next story tells of his maniacal attempts not just to trick the Magi into returning to him to give the juicy details, but he foreshadows it by saying, Come to me that I may pay homage to the newborn king, which is to say, to kill him. Because the next story will tell that his loathing would take him to the point of murdering all the male Jewish children in the area in an attempt to kill this newborn king. This attraction repulsion thing is not a light or laughing matter. It's very serious in this story. And these magi, these astrologers, you ask, how did they exhibit attraction and repulsion? Well, we know the attraction is obvious. That's the whole point of this story. That's why they're so starstruck. They have read in their uh, uh, astrology and in the, the stars and in the histories that this, this newborn king would come. And they set out on this journey that now is told in so many different stories in so many different ways. So we know how they were attracted, but were they repulsed too by this newborn king? Not by the king so much, I think, at least the newborn king, but by King Herod. If they had the wisdom, I think, to know exactly which star in the sky to follow Jesus, and that this Jesus would be the Messiah, would they also not have known the treacherous nature of the king that was already in power in the area? Surely word had gotten out enough. He wouldn't have to, they wouldn't have to read in a book or, 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 or look in the stars to know that Herod was a horrific king. Why would they go to talk to this King, but maybe they had this kind of attraction repulsion, attraction, repulsion thing going on with King Herod. Because we all know that power attracts us, even when we are afraid of it. And whether or not they felt that they were just simply obligated to go have dinner with the king, or they did it for more strategic reasons, we do not know. But they were drawn to him and all his regalia. So here is my learning for today that I want to share with you. The birth of the Messiah into our world is fraught with all kinds of complications. We know it's not just another pretty story. And the least of these complications isn't just the social psychological dynamic of compulsion and attraction. It would do us well to examine our motives when we are drawn to the Savior's side, so that we might more fully and completely receive all that God has to give to us through this baby Jesus. What is it that attracts us about the infant Jesus? Why do so many more people come at Christmas to hear this ancient story of God made real in a baby and knowing that there may be a, another side to that story, a more ominous side, might help us be aware that with every attraction, there may be a dangerous repulsion. And if we understand and think through that repulsion more, it might help us avoid falling into the negative and destructive and sometimes even violent nature that Herod was plummeted into. Knowing this might help us to more often feed the wolf of kindness and hope and goodness, to take the high road, the path to peace, the way of justice, the route of righteousness, the direction of love. Knowing ahead of time what to look for when we sidle up to that manger and hear the cooing of the doves and think of the pondering of Mary and Joseph, always allowing the shadow of the cross to hover just a little bit over our shoulders might make us just a little wiser 
with every decision we make. In the babe of Bethlehem, are we attracted to the fresh sense of a brand new beginning that we have longed for so long? That second chance that Colleen talked about? If so, then why are we repulsed when other people get new opportunities? When another person gets a second chance? When someone else gets a new lease on life? Why? Do we try to drag them down if this new baby represents new life for all of us? In the babe of Bethlehem, are we attracted to the innocence and the vulnerability of the babe, which seems to stir up in our soul this, this yearning for openness, that we too might be vulnerable, we too might be innocent once again. If so, then why aren't we more repulsed when people take advantage of another person's weaknesses? And why do we get such a thrill from watching influential people exploit the helpless and the vulnerable, oftentimes on primetime TV? Let's be honest, we get a thrill from that. Why, when we are so attracted to the innocence and vulnerability of this babe? In the babe of Bethlehem, are we attracted to this new embodiment of power made perfect in a gentle, quiet love? Because we know all too well all the old definitions of love don't work. All the old definitions of power aren't working for us. If so, then why are we repulsed when men exhibit traits of compassion and gentleness? And why aren't we more repulsed when women appear strong only through manipulation, deceit, and aggression? You see what I'm saying? If this baby represents a new kind of power in the world, why do we continue to try and use the old ways of using power in the world? Doesn't it make a difference in our lives? In the babe of Bethlehem, are we attracted to the possibility of God working through the most vulnerable amongst us? God champion, championing, seeing the divine at work in the least in our midst? If so, then why does our society have such a repulsion for the poor, the foreigner, the outcast, and the misfits, and very little time nor resources to spare for the invisible classes of our world? If Jesus represents in the babe of Bethlehem, the preeminent marginalized person. What does that mean for us and our neighbor, our real flesh and blood neighbor? With all their many variations and differences, problems and possibilities. Surely this babe makes a difference in how we live. While it may never be the case that we have the kind of gifts that would compare to the gold, frankincense, and myrrh the Magi's had to give to honor the baby, and we probably will never have the kind of status and power of King Herod to wreak havoc on our world trying to destroy the baby, nonetheless, we have our gifts and we have our powers, and we must know them well in order to use them well. And just assuming we will use them for good always puts us at risk of using them poorly at best or horribly at worst. Let us ponder during the season of, of Epiphany how we are attracted to Emmanuel, God with us, and how we are also repulsed by Emmanuel, God with us. 
If we do our prayers and our meditations well, we will honor God more fully. We will deepen our faith more surely so that we, like the Magi of old, will lay our gifts at the feet of Jesus and we will avoid Herod by taking another way home. May it be so. May it be so. Amen. And as we come to the end of our service, if you're looking for a way home, we entice you to come through our church, not for nefarious reasons, but for reasons of life and service and love. If you'd like to give your life to this baby Jesus, with all the complications he presents to us, I invite you to come forward as together we all stand as we are able and sing our final hymn.